Okay, well, um, thank you for inviting me to um, present here in Kiev. Um, this is actually my first time in Kiev. Um, I have been in Moscow um, many times. Uh, maybe I have seen some of you there. Um, also, um, I've been to Odessa a couple of times, and I think I'll go there in a couple of weeks. Um, today, um, I'm going to obviously uh, be talking about autism. I'm going to share with you uh, many research issues. Um, I will also talk a little bit about treatment as well. Now I have a question. Um, how many here are parents? Raise your hand. Okay, so how many here are relatives, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters? Um, how about um, professionals, psychologists, social workers? Um, how about medical doctors? That's a medical doctor. Okay. So we're talking about some medical issues too, which um, not many people do talk about. But my organization actually started um, looking at medical issues um, almost 30 years ago. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I have been active in the autism field uh, for 40 years, 4 zero. So I've seen quite a bit. Um, there are many people who are writing history books about autism, and they often spend a little time with me, which is quite nice. <laughs> um, even though I don't feel that old. Um, um, I've um, conducted research in many areas, including uh, behavior modification, um, severe behaviors, published uh, quite a bit, including a book on self-injurious behavior. Um, I spent um, about 20 years studying sensory issues, vision, hearing. Um, I also was um, very much involved in medical issues involved in autism. Uh, my organization um, is the oldest research autism organization in the world. Uh, we started in 1967, 51 years ago. Um, the founder of my organization um, is Dr. Bernard Renland, uh, who passed away about 12 years ago. And he was the person who said that autism was not caused by the mother. Uh, for many years, they blamed the mother for um, um, ignoring her child when the child needed help. And the founder of my organization, Dr. Rumlin, um, he was a parent and a researcher. Um, he read the literature. That was in the 1950s, early 60s. And he concluded that autism had some biological basis. And he suggested at that time, in 1964, that autism was likely due to genetics um, and to neurology. And a few years later, he suggested that the environment may also affect autism. And although he said this 50 years ago, uh, this is actually where much of the field is today. Um, before I go into detail about autism and research, um, I do want to talk about the big conference that I helped co-sponsor in Moscow. Um, we've done this six straight years. There I am. 
And um, basically, um, uh, this organization, Autism Challenges, uh, was instrumental, very important, in bringing ADA, Behavior Modification, as well as PECS, Picture Exchange Communication System, to Eastern Europe, including Russia and actually here in Ukraine. And the conference talks, they have many issues they discuss. And the presenters are from all over the world, including the United States. I, I usually bring in four or five researchers every year to Moscow. Um, they have researchers in Israel, India, United Kingdom, Holland, Saudi Arabia, France, and more. So it's a real international conference. And um, that's a conference I look forward to every year. Okay. So next slide. So let me talk a little about the core symptoms of autism. Um, in the old days, uh, half of lectures, half of the lecture on autism would be on what is autism? But now we only spend a few minutes because uh, many people know what autism is. But honestly, um, people have different perspectives of what autism is. And so it's important to try to come up with a, a general consensus. So a very important part that I feel everyone with autism has are social issues. Personally, I have never met a person with autism who has perfect social skills. So social issues are really an uh, important issue as far as understanding what autism is about. And we see different types of social issues. I can't look up there because I don't understand what it says. <laughs> so I look down here. Um, so what is um, social but awkward? Um, often these individuals are given the diagnosis of the Asperger's syndrome. And basically they want friends, but they can't keep them because they don't understand appropriate social skills. And, um, how many people know who Temple Grandin is? It was a movie about her and books, and actually I went to graduate school with her, so I got to know her for a long time. And with her, she enjoys being with people, but she's also fine with being all by herself. So we call it asocial. A third type of social difficulty, um, is what we sometimes refer to as antisocial. They don't want to be with people. And in the early days of autism, it was, the people assumed that all of them were antisocial. But that's not true. But what's interesting, when you talk to adults with autism and ask them about their social behavior, um, they often will say that the main reason they do not like to be with other people um, is sensory related. Uh, Temple Grand would say sometimes he would hug her and she bothered her a great deal. Um, others, they say they, they smell the person, like perfume or men's cologne, and that smell bothers them. Or it could be the sound of the voice, it just bothers their ear. And as a result, they try to avoid people because it's, it's painful to be around them. So, so this idea of antisocial, we're starting to understand that much of it is due to sensory issues. Another, well, can't look up there. Um, another um, common problem is your communication, and this is also, I think, really true for everyone with autism is that they don't communicate properly. We know some do talk, but often it's not related to social. It's often related to what they're interested in. Um, 
Also, um, with communication, we know some repeat words they hear. And others talk very little or not at all. And it's very important to be able to teach them how to communicate. Because we know that when they do not communicate, we often see behavioral problems, like tantruming, aggression, and, and self-injury. So communication is very important, and I'll be talking more about communication later. And more recently, as a core problem of autism, we see um, emotional issues. I hope I'm going slow enough. Um, and one, um, I don't think it's true for everyone with autism, but for many, they would be, some people feel they lack empathy. They don't understand the feelings of others. And that's why some treatments um, work on understanding other people's feelings. You know, they'll have the happy face, the sad face, and so on because they just don't understand it. They just don't pick it up. And another important issue, which has been around a long time, but we just started talking about it now, is anxiety. Anxiety is extremely common in autism. Um, the problem that we're not studying it for many years is that we cannot observe anxiety. So people who study behavioral therapy, they often do not acknowledge anxiety because you can't see it. But many adults now who are writing books, including Temple Grandin, um, who are giving lectures, um, they are saying anxiety is extremely um, important. It really bothers them. They're very, they're very you know, anxious. They, just don't feel right. And what's interesting, and I'll talk a little bit about later, there's some indication that having gastrointestinal problems, like constipation, that is actually um, considered related to anxiety, which surprised me. But if you think about it, when you have gastrointestinal problems, it causes internal pressure, internal stress and we feel that is associated with anxiety, but we need to learn a lot more. And there's other behaviors not listed that are associated with autism, but are not as common. Uh, we know many are what we call insistence on sameness. They like things the same, and if something changes, they'll get upset. And we feel that this is due to their understanding. And sometimes they get confused in terms of what to do, when to do, and so on. And if things are always the same, then they feel more comfortable. They, they know what to expect. Um, some, but not all, um, have repetitive behaviors. They do the same thing over and over again. It could be um, the more obvious is uh, behaviors such as rocking or hand flapping um, and even um, moving their eyes around. We've seen that quite a bit. So a repetitive behavior has occurred quite a bit. Um, uh, when you talk to adults, they say they do repetitive behaviors to calm themselves down. It helps them block out the world that's too stimulating and too confusing. So by doing repetitive behaviors, they're able to focus their mind, their attention on themselves to block out everywhere else. But then we see the excessive tantruming, especially in the children. Um, we see the aggression, and we see self-injury, head banging and hitting themselves. And we feel with um, especially self-injury, anxiety, and uh, aggression, that there are many reasons why. 
And one of the problems in the field is that these problems are treated based on the, the training of the professional. So if the professional, say we have anxiety. If the professional is treating, uh, if a medical doctor is treating anxiety, they may give them a pill to lower their anxiety. If a behaviorist is treating anxiety, they may involve some type of relaxation therapy to have them calm themselves down. If someone who is doing sensory therapy, they'll um, often will swing them very slowly to calm themselves, the, the children down, to reduce anxiety. So the, the way you, you treat some of these behaviors is based on the training of the professional. And although that makes sense to some degree, we're realizing that there are many causes of anxiety. So the anxiety is related to gastrointestinal problems, such as constipation. Shouldn't you then treat the constipation to reduce the anxiety? rather than relaxation therapy or pill and so on. So the field is starting to look at many of their behaviors in different ways. And um, I feel strongly that the best way to treat some of their problems is to try to do your best to understand the reason why and then develop the correct treatment based on that. And that, I think, is the future of the field. Okay, so um, let's start with some of the basics. Uh, the rate of autism, we had some press here earlier there asking about the incidence of autism. And for many years, um, in the 1990s and before, um, we only said it was one in 2000, roughly. And we only knew statistics that were very good in England, United States and Japan, and it was all consistent. So in those days, it was quite rare. And then, based on the US government, um, they stated that autism started to increase in the 1980s. And so if you're looking for the cause, see what may have started happening in the 1980s. And then over the years, it has increased dramatically. And this is a controversial issue, because one simple way is to say it's just better awareness. You have better aware, it's easier to diagnose. So there's always been a high incidence of autism in the community, it's just that we didn't know that they were there. Well, uh, one, if you rely on the research, um, it shows it's mixed. Um, there is better awareness, but there really is an increase in autism. And there's a lot of research to show that's true. It's, it's both, not just awareness. And in the United States, um, in April, they came up with a number of 1 in 59, which is the highest um, this one agency of the government has ever reported, one in 59. But what's interesting, well, one, I know a lot of countries around the world use this one in 59 if they don't have their own statistics. But it's really important when you talk about one in 59 that this was based on eight-year-old children. Okay. Not little ones, these are eight-year-olds. And if you talk about, um, and also the, the 1 in 59 that was reported this year, that was based on data collected in 2014. So the data was collected four years ago. Okay. So honestly, when one says 1 in 59, that means 1 in 59 eight-year-olds in 2014, not in 2018. And to complicate even worse, if you think of the birth rate, say if a parent is saying, what are the odds 
that I'll have a child with autism today. It's not one in 59. Okay? Because that's eight year olds in 2014. So if you work the numbers backwards, if you talk about birth rate of autism, it's actually the birth rate of autism in the year 2006, 12 years ago. Okay, so if you talk about birth rate of autism, what are the chances of having a child with autism? We don't know what it is today, but we know back 12 years ago it was 1 in 59. Okay, so a lot of people don't think like this, I mean, and they should. I just actually wrote a paper on it. And so, given that autism has increased over the years, I would, I, you know, I think it's very easy to assume that the birth rate of autism today is much, much higher than one in 59. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so next slide. So I basically already talked a little about this. Why is there an increase? And again, um, we feel it's <clears throat> excuse me, better awareness, but there's actually a real increase. And then the question is why? So I know there has been, uh, we can go next slide. So I know there's been a lot of research on genetics. Actually, the, at least the United States government has put in a lot of money into, into genetics. I mean, a lot of money. And a lot of people like myself would say, yes, let's look at genetics. But also, with all that money, let's try to figure out other things as well, like how best to help them. So with a lot of money put into genetics, um, we feel we could explain 20% um, or one in five. And here are different syndromes related to autism that have been found over the years. So 20% were confident purely genetics called syndromic. But then the question is what about the other 80%? And I'm sure some of that 80% will also be purely genetic, but then we're still figuring it out. But there's also research looking at many other things as well. So next one. So although this was three years ago, it's I think a very important study, Canadian study, a very expensive study. And they looked at 85 families who had two or more children with autism in the same family. And their goal was to find out what are the autism genes? We're here two in the family have it. And they looked at a hundred genes that have been associated with autism to some degree. Most haven't been replicated. But they thought if there's a, a gene or set of genes related to autism, here are the hundred that are most likely. So they studied these 85 families. It's a very expensive study um, everyone in the autism field is very excited about these find, uh, the, this study because thought now we could figure out the autism genes. In fact, the, one of the main researchers was very well known, one of the top geneticists in the world, actually. And what they found was, I'd say, a little disappointing. That is, um, almost 70% um, there was no little overlap between their genes. So the brother and sister, or brother, brother, or sister, sister, both autism, the genes overlapped a little, roughly 30%, but most of their genes didn't. And so um, we're realizing it was much more than one gene or a set of genes. But So it was important to know, but at the same time, they didn't find what they were looking for. Another important study, next slide, and this is a little older, and this is what a lot of us in the field are looking at, um, that it's not just a, a gene, it's genes and the environment. We sometimes say predisposition. 
For example, there's predisposition to peanut allergies. For many people, peanuts are fine, but for some, it can be deadly. And so in this study, this was at Stanford University, so you know, one of the top universities um, actually in the world, and they looked at twins, 192, and based on some very powerful statistics, they were able to conclude that the environment contributes to roughly 58%, so quite a bit, while the genes only contributed to about 38%. So actually these kind of numbers are somewhat similar to the previous study too. So from this and actually from a lot of research since then, uh, we do feel the environment has a big part in causing autism. And the question is, so um, given the something in the environment and a predisposition, something, um, a predisposition to that toxin, we might say, that could trigger the autism. So, there have, so I'll talk about some of the environmental issues. So next slide, I might guess that's it. So one we've known since the 1960s, that exposure to a virus, either during the pregnancy or soon after, can be associated with autism. And there's actually quite a few viruses that have been associated with autism. That is, during the pregnancy, the mother has a virus. It doesn't mean everyone who's exposed to that virus will have a child with autism, but they'll have an increased chance of having a child with autism. But we also feel that toxins in the water, in the food, and in the air can be associated with autism. For example, there's actually quite a few studies now showing the closer you live to farms, you know, where they grow crops, they use as pesticides to kill the bugs. The closer you live to these farms, the risk of having a child with autism increases. So when you live near a farm, um, it gets into the groundwater, it's on the air, I'm sure, um, but more likely to have an autistic child. But it doesn't mean everyone living near a farm has an autistic child. We feel, again, a genetic predisposition. And there's also some pretty good research showing the closer you live to a highway where a lot of automobiles, cars, the more likely you will have a child with autism. But again, not everyone living near the highway will have a child with autism, but if you have a, a genetic predisposition. And what's interesting, um, and there's no research yet, but if you talk to a lot of doctors who see these children when they're very young, uh, many of them are what we call fragile, medically fragile. They're sickly, okay. they're colicky, they're crying a lot, they're... Um, have ear infections. Um, so they're, medic they're not strong medically. They're on the weak side, you might say. And so the idea is, if you have a child who's weak um, and likely caused by genetics, then um, given exposure to pesticides or pollution um, may lead to autism. But this isn't, again, we're working on trying to figure this out. But we're looking at risks, and um, we, we hope someday we'll be able to say, this causes autism, or this causes autism. Or given this gene, be careful, you should, probably shouldn't live near a highway. So we're working on that quite a bit. Um, the problem we have is there are many different types of autism. Some people say 12 to 15 types of autism. Some of you say 100 different types of autism. And actually, my organization has been working on subtyping autism for a long time. Because if we could divide up the autism spectrum, so type A autism, type B autism, type C autism, um, 
then we'll be better able to figure out the cause of each type, and we'll be better able to figure out the best treatment for each type. Okay, so some people are working on it, I've been working on it, um, it is a, a difficult task, but um, many of us feel if we can subtype autism, we'll be able to figure out answers faster. So let me go to the next slide. So I do want to comment on males versus females. <clears throat> so for many years, we always felt it was for every three males, one female. And the question is why? And um, I know there's some work in England especially looking at a hormone called testosterone. And they feel that exposure to testosterone during the pregnancy is related to autism. Now what's interesting, when you look at females with autism, they have a lot of male characteristics. Okay, so we think that might be the testosterone, which is often male-related. But what's interesting, after the 1990s, um, research has shown that there were more males than females, maybe from 4 to 1 to 5 to 1. And so some people guess theory that maybe if there's a pollution out there, whether it's pesticides or automobile exhaust or something else, maybe that could lead to uh, increase or a burst of testosterone during pregnancy. We don't know, uh, but when you do research, you have to make hypotheses, and then you have to figure out whether that hypothesis is true or not. And what's interesting, um, historically, there's a lot of talk when autism affects a female, it's much worse. They have more severe behaviors. And this was the general feeling for many years. Okay, next slide. But what's interesting, actually research out of the UK, and actually other people are working on it now, uh, we're finding that many females are not given the diagnosis of autism. So one could argue they have autism, but they're just not given the diagnosis because they um, it's a more of a mild form. In general, females are more social, they're more better communication. So with many, not all females with autism, they're a little more social. They're a little more, um, like, they a little better. Um, but um, they still have autism. And so um, now we're starting to realize that females who have severe behaviors are more likely to be diagnosed with autism, and those females who have just milder forms of autism, they're overlooked and not given a proper diagnosis. And because with females, um, for example, if they have insistence on sameness, they like things the same all the time, it's often interpreted as obsessive compulsive behavior, more likely in females than males. And if they're picky eaters, which I'll talk about a little later, um, they're often labeled as having anorexia, just not eating much. So again, um, with females, they're looked at differently, and as a result, they're not given a proper label of autism. And a lot of people are now arguing there should be two diagnostic criteria. One way to diagnose males to see if they have autism, and another way to diagnose females if they have autism. And I understand there's some research going on there um, today. Um, but what's also interesting I want to mention, and this is important, I don't have a slide, is that there's a lot of Research, and you might, if you're reading the literature, just in the past 
In fact, there's an article today, but in the past um, few weeks, um, they're, um, they're close to diagnosing autism based on blood samples, looking at what are called metabolites, especially what's called amino acids, <coughs> um, related to that. And there's some really good researchers at the Mind Institute and other places that are very close. In fact, um, one group, um, they're now um, getting it approved, and it's possible by the by next year there might be a blood test to diagnose autism, but not everyone with autism. Right now, they, they feel their test could diagnose, what they say, 17%. However, I know at the University of Arkansas and Arizona State, which we're funding, um, they feel they could diagnose many more, and they're very close. And I really predict, um, not next year, but the year after, uh, we're going to be able to diagnose autism based on either blood or urine, and um, it will be an accurate diagnosis, too. Because right now, as many of you know, autism is diagnosed based on behavior. And that's not always accurate, especially with females. Okay. okay, so let's jump into another area, um, um, the brain. I don't want to go into too detail. Um, I'm not a brain expert, but I know enough. Uh, I've done a little research on this, but my organization also funds a lot of research on autism. Actually, we, we fund research worldwide. And some of it is on neurology, because we do see some impairment, some deficits in the brain. And if we really want to understand the entire autism condition, we really need to look at it in many different ways, not just genetics, not just behavior. And so one of the problems um, in looking at the brain, um, and other areas too, but particularly the brain, there's many different types of autism. That's why I mentioned subtyping earlier. And so, you know, so one study might say this area of the brain is abnormal or impaired, and another laboratory says, no, we're not seeing any problems. It doesn't mean that one finding was wrong, it's more likely it's different types of autism. But there are some areas of the brain that not every um, autopsy is true, but many of them, a lot of, you might say, consistency um, regarding the brain and autism. Okay, so next slide, over there. Okay. So one, which has received a lot of media attention, actually since the 1980s, is that their brain size is larger than average. When, um, when they're very young. And from a lot of the research, we're finding that we call too many neurons in the brain, more than they show. And what's interesting, the more neurons they have in the brain, the more than um, they show, um, the more severe the autism. And so we don't know why uh, many of them have larger brains right now. There's a lot of theories, um, but we really don't know at this time. Um, but it's also interesting, which I think is very telling, very important, is that with the brain we have um, neurons that are short to communicate in local areas of the brain, and then we have neurons that are very long to communicate from one area of the brain to the other. And a consistent finding is that with autism, they don't have many long neurons. So one area of the brain is not communicating to another area as well. There's some, but not as many. And at the same time, there are too many small neurons in little in specific areas. Okay. So that might be part of the obsessive compulsive, the insistence on sameness, we don't know. But, um, so too many small neurons in specific areas, and um, certain regions are not talking to other regions, fewer of long neurons. Okay, and we feel that um, 
could probably explain quite a bit of autism, but we don't know why. That's what we're trying to figure out. And so, again, with a lot of this research, it's extremely difficult because we haven't subtyped them yet. We look at many different types of individuals, and that has been one of the reasons why progress has been very slow. Okay. So here, I'm going to talk about just a few other areas of the brain that, again, consistent. Many findings that show similar uh, findings, results. So on the cerebellum, motor activity, um, and also involved in coordination, um, also attention, there's some research on that. And we know uh, quite a few people with autism, they have poor co coordination and poor um, motor activity, especially those with Asperger's syndrome. And we also know there's a lot of attention problems in autism. For example, um, they have difficulty shifting their attention. So if something stays over here, and they're looking at, and then something over here says, is trying to get their attention. You know, look at me, um, um, they say their name. It takes them a long time to sh change their attention. With someone without autism, it only might take a half a second to go here to here with attention. With autism, it could take two or three seconds where they gradually change their attention. And that's we feel in the cerebellum. We know a lot of them have very focused attention. And we know a lot have what we call attention deficits. It's very difficult for them to pay attention for a very long period of time. Another area that has received a lot of um, quality research is it's called the amygdala. And the amygdala is in the center of the brain, part of what's called the limbic system. And that's in charge of emotions. And I mentioned earlier, they do have emotional issues, such as empathy issues and anxiety issues. And the amygdala is also involved in social behavior, which we know is also impaired in autism. So we all feel that deficits or problems in the amygdala explain, could explain some, most, or all of their social problems or emotional problems. Okay, next slide. Um, the anterior uh, cingulate cortex. Um, this is uh, actually quite common problem in autism. Um, it's responsible for language, the thought, and the autonomic nervous system like the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic. People know sympathetic, parasympathetic, sympathetic gets you aroused, it's a fight or flight, you know, that's part related to anxiety. While parasympathetic um, inhibits you, it slows you down. And there's usually an interplay between sympathetic and parasympathetic for your arousal state. And what's interesting, there's a lot of good research showing that with autism, they have problems in their parasympathetic. They have problems bringing down their arousal level. And you can actually see that at the neuro neurological level. Another area is the prefrontal cortex. And that's involved in personality, um, thoughts, actions, uh, decisions, and planning. So executive functioning of the skills. Okay, so we see these deficits. We don't know why. Is it genetics? Is it the environment? Um, like the combination? We, we just don't know why. And as I said so far a few times, but I'll be seeing it many times, there's different types of autism, and it's very difficult to take a, a group of all different types and find the same thing. We need to subtype them. And then once you can subtype them, subgroups, it's going to be much easier to figure out the cause and the most effective treatments. And again, a lot of laboratories, including mine, are working on this issue. Okay, next slide. Oh. I usually don't talk too much, so I'm talking a lot today. Okay, as far as medical problems, um, this has often been ignored for many years, <clears throat> before the 1990s, because 
when um, a child would be brought to the doctor for a diagnosis, the doctor often didn't say, um, how often does your child go to the bathroom? Or does your child have allergies? And um, so it was quite, uh, it's been ignored for many years until the mid-1990s. And actually my organization <coughs> came up, um, developed the first think tank and that focused on medical issues back in, again, I think it was 95. So for, as was, for many years, doctors were not aware that these individuals have medical issues, and we feel rather strongly that more than half have some medical issues that need, need to be treated medically. But again, if you're not aware of this, or if you're a physician who's not aware of this, then you don't treat it. Okay, next slide. So probably the most common medical problem that we're aware of <clears throat> um, is gastrointestinal problems. Um, especially constipation, very common in these individuals. <clears throat> Basically a child, when they have a, a bowel movement, it should uh, normally be every day or every other day. Um, but, you know, when you talk to parents, they'll say, well, their child does not have a constipation because he goes uh, once a week. And you go, well, that's not enough. Okay. So, just being aware that your child should have a bowel movement every day or every other day, the worst, every three days, um, is important to know. Because, as I mentioned earlier, constipation is related to anxiety. And also you have this internal pressure that causes stress. And people often don't feel well when they have constipation. Um, another is chronic diarrhea. There's so many parents in me who will say, you know, ever since my child was six months of age or a year, they've had constant diarrhea for the past four or five years. Okay. So this is common. And another is a, a bloating, excessive gas. Um, and that's often related to constipation. And so it's really important that um, parents as well as professionals are aware of this. You know, if you're a therapist, speech therapist, behavioral therapist, and you know, the child has a lot of gas, well, you might want to uh, find out you know, about bowel movements and maybe refer to a physician. As far as treating their gastrointestinal, um, right now um, the research is mixed. Um, our recommendation is to treat um, these children like any other children who has GI problems. However, a lot of parents are also looking at special diets like the gluten-free, casein-free diet. Gluten, wheat, barley, oats, Casines, dairy products, milk, ice cream, and so on, cheese. And um, that um, when parents put their children on these diets, that they sometimes will see the first normal bowel movement in years, within a week. And again, the research is mixed, probably because they're looking at all different types of individuals. And although the research is mixed, um, Sometimes I'll tell parents, well, you know, just try it for a month. And if it works, great. And if not, well, then it didn't work, obviously. So that's something to consider. But other um, interventions that are common for gastrointestinal would be um, probiotics, very popular in autism, and also digestive enzymes. And with this, again, not much research, but some, it's mixed. And again, if your child has severe gastrointestinal problems, I, if I was a parent, I would try it. And if it works, great. But if not, then you have to realize that it just doesn't and move on to something else. Now, as far as, again, reasons for these, um, one is that we have some pretty solid research that, as far as the bacteria in our gastrointestinal system um, is abnormal. 
there are, they lack some bacteria that they should have, and there's not as much diversity. And they also have some harmful bacteria. Clostridia is actually quite common in autism, and it's, it can be very harmful. We know that many children with autism are picky eaters, french fries, candy, and so on. And we feel that could contribute to their GI problems. And what's also not discussed much, and we have an editorial in one of our newsletters, is just drinking water. Because what's interesting, we know with autism, there's a lot of good evidence. They don't feel um, internal sensations like many of us do. So they might not, so there's evidence actually that they may not feel thirsty. You know, when we feel thirsty, we drink water, but they may not. Um, and so um, we know that constipation in general can lead be caused by a lack of water consumption. So actually there's a chart we can look at just briefly. So this basically um, refers to how much water one should be drinking. Um, and so actually there's, um, it's starting to be more and more people are thinking that many of these children are dehydrated. They just don't feel that thirst feeling. Again, there's some evidence to show that's true. And as a result, by being dehydrated, one, it's bad for your gastrointestinal system, but it's also not very good for the brain either. And so I often recommend to parents, make sure your child drinks a lot of water, because it's very good for them. OK, next. Okay, so another um, problem in autism is their immune system. And um, actually we've known since the 1980s that they have, uh, many of them have immune issues. In fact, some people feel autism for 20 or 30 percent is an autoimmune disorder. You see a lot of immune issues in the families. And we see some um, behaviors or signs that indicate um, allergies or immune system issues. A lot of them have allergies, airborne, um, pollen, um, very common in autism. Um, skin, and eczema, um, the um, peeling of the um, skin. And also food allergies, which I know there's a lot of um, talk about food allergies, and some evidence, not a lot, but some, that certain foods that they eat could cause headaches, nausea, and well, let's assume, say, a child is allergic to milk, whether it's cow's milk or mother's milk, let's say cow's milk. So it's possible that ever since they started drinking milk, they've always had a headache, or they've always felt nauseous, but they don't know different. So if you, all your life, have a headache or feel nausea, then one, it's going to be very hard to pay attention. Um, it's going to be very hard to pick up a language. Um, it's, it's difficult in one way or another. So I know there's a lot of different ways for allergy testing. Um, a lot of them are not super accurate. Um, but what happens, and there's this old saying, I assume it's true, that if a child craves, very much wants the same food, like always wants to drink milk, that that might be an indication that he or she is allergic to milk. And obviously it's very hard to take it away, <laughs> but I know that people have um, substituted milk with um, almond milk. Um, I know there's some talk about camel's milk because it seems to be healthier, I just don't know. And so, um, but it's important to realize that some do have um, food allergies. And some ways to look, it's not 100% accurate, is if they occasionally have red ears, their ears are red, not all the time, but sometimes that might be a sign of a food allergy. Um, if their cheeks are red, or they have darkness under the eyes, that might be an indication. But it's important to go to a specialist. And there's different, again, ways to test for allergies, 
you know, most of them are not 100% accurate, but, you know, if there's some indication they're allergic to a food item, um, I would take the child off of that food item and see if there's any change. And not, don't tell other people, you know, because you might look for something that's not there, but don't tell your spouse or don't tell the teacher or, or relative and see if they might notice something. And that's the best way to see if an intervention works or not. And as far as why they have immune system issues, and again, quite common, um, we think it could be genetic, um, or, and or maybe uh, during the pregnancy the mother was exposed to something, or soon after birth that could have impacted their immune system. We, we just don't know. Um, we, you feel that um, pollution can impact the immune system. But again, you know, I wish I had a lot more answers, but you know, every year we have a little more. Okay, next slide. So this is a metabolism. And this is basically looking at autism at, at the cell level, the cellular level. And now we're starting to realize that autism is not a neurological issue, but probably more of a, a cellular issue. That autism is due to um, the cells not um, working properly. And one of the most common findings, and this has been replicated many times, <clears throat> that they have impairment in what's called the mitochondrial. And the mitochondrial, that's the energy center of the cell. It produces the energy so the cell can work and it doesn't work properly. And again, there's a lot of evidence to show that's true. And so now a lot of us are looking at ways to improve mitochondrial function. There's certain vitamin formulas. Um, um, so we're just still trying to figure that out. But the mitochondrial, um, some feel that everyone with autism has a mitochondrial dis uh, disorder or impairment. But again, so this is a, a very important finding. Many people in labs all around the world are finding mitochondrial dysfunction. So again, the energy center of the cell. If the cell is not working properly, then one could argue the rest of the body is not working properly. Another part of metabolism that's received a lot of attention about 20 years ago um, it's pretty much accepted by many, including me, is methylation. And methylation is you know, it's a biological process, and it would probably take a half hour to an hour to describe it, but it's involved in neurology, neurological function, and also detoxifying the, the body. So if they're exposed to toxins, um, that even when they're older, the toxins build up and causes some type of brain damage, people argue. And there's some evidence that with autism, they don't detoxify like everyone else. What's interesting, for many years, we looked at the hair, because you could analyze the hair to see how well they get rid of toxins out of their body. And what happened was, um, we were always happy, saying, oh, look, you know, um, there, there isn't much coming out, so that's good because that means they're not exposed to much toxins. But then the experts came to us, not in autism, and said, no, that's bad, because you want toxins in your hair and through your skin and your urine and so on. And so we were actually fooled in a way. Again, we saw very little toxins in the hair. We assumed that was good, little exposure, but it was lower than they should have. They should be excreting more toxins, because we're all exposed to it, no matter what, but we normally excrete it through our body. But with autism, many do not. And that's related to this methylation, methylation cycle. Okay, so we could go to the next slide. So I know it's the next slide because I matched the picture to my slide. <laughs> So here's an issue that's not talked about much, but I talk about it. Um, I, I've written quite a bit about this. Um, and I think 
um, parents and professionals should be aware of it. Um, is that many, not all, but many people with autism deal with a lot of discomfort and pain. Again, people don't talk about it and they should because a lot of these individuals are suffering. When you talk to adults, they're complaining all the time. You know, they said their body, you know, has a lot of stress and discomfort. So they have deep massages once or twice a week. <clears throat> um, lights bother them, so they often wear baseball caps. Um, if you know Stephen Shore, who writes a lot, a good friend of mine, he's always wearing a baseball cap because of the lights bothering him. But many people with autism do. Sounds bother them. A lot of them put earplugs in their ears. Um, and so there's different, I, I, I categorize two types of, of stress or pain. And one's internal, so like the immune system I mentioned, for example, allergies, whether it could be food allergies that affect the brain or just a sinus from airborne allergies, gastrointestinal pain from constipation and bloating, excessive gas, um, anxiety, that's internal pain. Everyone's experienced some anxiety at one time or another. They have a lot of anxiety. And then the discomfort and pain could come from outside their body. And that, again, allergies would fit, figure that. But also, as I mentioned, sound bothers many of them. You know, sometimes when there's a, a siren from an ambulance or fire truck, you know, some of them have a severe temper tantrum. It's very severe. Or they cover their ears and then run away from that sound as fast as possible. Now what's interesting, like Temple Grand and a few others, um, they say that they're always um, on edge. That is, they never know when there's going to be a sudden sound. They're in a room and there's a sound. And it really bothers them greatly. And so when they go into an environment, a place, where particularly if there's a lot of people, they don't know when someone's going to you know, make a loud noise or a baby's going to cry or someone's going to drop something, and so when they go into, you might say, social situations, sometimes they're just scared that there's going to be that sudden sound. And I hear this from a lot of adults. A lot of their anxiety is because they're afraid that the sudden sound will happen. Um, and I mentioned about visuals, and all the lights bother them. Fluorescent lights are considered the worst for them. It just bothers them greatly. And once in a while, I'll consult with the school, and I'll tell them not to use fluorescent lights, like incandescent lights. Tactile, some of them, if you touch them, they have a burning sensation. Um, and so they're very careful in terms of what clothes they wear. And that's one of the reasons why we feel a lot of them like to strip and just run around naked, because clothes just bother them. I know Temple Brandon, when she writes, she often, you know, when there's a change of season and you have to change your clothes, she says it takes her a long time to change the type of clothes because it bothers her differently. So it's, they're very sensitive, many of them, to touch. Um, and also smell. Um, sometimes smell is, you know, bothers them greatly. So we often tell therapists and teachers and even physicians, you know, not to wear perfume or cologne to say, keep it, you know, just no smell, <clears throat> because it does bother them. So, again, I, I wish more and more people would realize that many, if not the majority, of these individuals do put, suffer from discomfort and pain. Because if we start to realize that, you know, maybe we'll be able to get more funding to try to figure out different ways to help them. Okay, next one. <clears throat> okay, so treating behavior. <clears throat> uh, because, you know, with behavior you see it, it's observable. You don't often see the internal. But and since um, the 1960s, you know, over 50 years ago, we see their behaviors associated with autism and the goal is to treat them. And for many years, actually when I first got started, um, they were using very powerful medications, Haldol, Tegretol, Melorel. I mean, these are powerful ones. If you take a, 
you kind of turn into, you know, you, you have very, very little energy. You just sit there staring in the lab. And what was interesting, uh, when it gave these very powerful drugs to treat behaviors like aggression, like self-injury, um, they, they would say, well, we gave this very powerful medication, and the aggression stopped. Or we gave this very powerful medication, and their self-injury stopped. Well, the thing is, now they're just sitting there staring into space, and it's not very good to the brain. So they weren't really treating the behavior itself, they were just dampening down the person, which is not very healthy. But over the years, you know, we've been looking at different medications, and, you know, there's no perfect medication for autism, <laughs> um, because a lot of them do have side effects. And um, I know with my organization and some others, um, we only suggest medication um, if it's last resort. You know, you tried everything, it just doesn't work when it's severe. Because medications just aren't good for the brain. You will, and, they, and everyone realizes it doesn't deal with the core problem, the underlying problem, it just deals with the symptoms. But an, another treatment that also came out in the 60s is behavior modification. And a lot of it, um, the work came out of UCLA in Los Angeles, and I was able to work at that clinic for three years. <clears throat> and um, basically used behavioral techniques based on a, a famous psychologist, um, Skinner, B.F. Skinner. And um, over the years, um, Behavior modification, or they call it applied behavior analysis, or ABA, has shown to be very effective. In fact, out of all the treatments out there, that has the most research. But they only look at the behavior. They don't look at whether the child might have constipation, or headaches, or even anxiety. They don't acknowledge anxiety because you can't see anxiety, at least the hardcore behaviorists. And, but they're very successful. Initially, it was very controversial. Um, because they used punishment to stop the behavior. Uh, they had a stick with electricity at the end, and if they were to act up, tantrum, or hurt themselves, they would give them an electric shock, and the behavior stopped. And when I worked at the clinic, when I was very young, <clears throat> 40 years ago, um, I, which I didn't like, I was hitting them to stop their behavior. And even when they were crying, one way to stop their crime was to spank them, and it did stop their crime, but it was not a humane way to do that. And I, after a couple of years, I, I left that clinic because it, it just <clears throat> didn't agree with me. I, there was much more natural ways to help them. But over the years, ABA has changed. They don't use punishment anymore. But it's important with ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, and again, an extremely important way to help these children, um, it's a technique to optimize, to improve teaching. It's not a curriculum. You take the curriculum and then you use these techniques. And I'll talk a little bit more about it in a few minutes, because it is very important. But over the years, uh, we're realizing there's other ways to help these individuals. So powerful drugs, no more. There's a few, but they're not as powerful. Um, but we are looking in other ways. It's called the biomedical approach, looking at their chemistry and changing that, often through nutrition, <clears throat> looking at strengthening the immune system, um, the nutrition, um, certain vitamin, vitamin D seems to be very helpful, vitamin D6, there's a lot of research on it, uh, dimethylglycine, there's DMG, and there's platfolic acid and so on. So there's a lot of nutrients that seems to help them. Um, and this is especially true if they're picky eaters because they're not eating a, a variety of foods. And in fact, sometimes uh, we use the, uh, the term um, starving brain, indicating the brain is starving for nutrients. And But for any child, we want them to have good nutrition. And with autism, they sometimes don't because of their eating habits. 
And we know other ways to help them. There's different sensory interventions. I haven't received too much research, but a lot of adults say it's very helpful. Um, methods to communicate, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, teach them social skills, how to interact with other children appropriately. And there's a, a few therapies out there regarding that. Cognitive therapy is starting to get a lot more attention. Um, exercise. A lot of people don't think much about exercise, but <clears throat> there's a lot of good research showing exercise actually helps their behavior, become more attentive, healthier. And a lot of these children do not get enough exercise. And I'm actually doing some work in that. So, and there's a lot of other interventions. <clears throat> and, um, but what I tell parents is that almost every week, there seems to be a brand new treatment out there. And um, you only have a certain amount of time, you only have a certain amount of money, and also availability, obviously, in, in different countries. But be very careful what you sign up on. The best thing to do is if there's some research to show it really does work, rather than just a good guess. However, you know, if it does make sense to you, and it doesn't cost much, and you feel it's very safe, it's up to you to decide. You know, and but be very careful. You have to make sure if you try it, it says it will really help. And actually, there's a checklist um, I developed. Uh, if you go to autism.com, that's my major website, and you'll find a checklist. And I know it's, I don't think it's in Ukrainian, even though I'd like to translate. I know it's in Russian, it's in 20 different languages, where you can fill it out whenever you want. It's free, and you get scores, and you can compare them over time to see if the child's getting better. Let me check the next slide. So, and I already talked a lot about ABA, behavioral modification. So as I mentioned, <clears throat> this is a technique. So, and it's been developed uh, for autism in a way. And what's really good is that it's, it's taken roughly 50 years to come up with the, the, like, the best different ways to teach them. And what's most important is that they keep track of whether the child's doing well or not. So if you try a technique and it's not working, you don't rely on memory, you have it written, you keep track. So if it's not working, then you change it. And you keep changing it until it works. And, um, and again, a lot of evidence. Um, <clears throat> there are people who are certified and they go through a couple of years of training and internship. Um, but there's others who just learn it on YouTube or buy a book. And um, I'd be a little careful because you don't know for sure if they're doing it correctly. And you really need to do it correctly. Um, and that's why a lot of people prefer going to those who have been certified, who have gone through proper training. So I just want to mention a couple other interventions, um, more behavioral, um, structured teaching or teach. Um, this is actually quite popular for a long time. Um, it was actually integrated into schools. It just made things a little easier. And um, basically, the idea is to provide the individual a lot of um, supports, help them figure things out. So, like physical organization, <clears throat> um, when you um, look at something, go from left to right, from up to down, or in this classroom itself, the yellow area is where you do music, the green area is where you read books, um, the purple area is where you play, and so on. So the child knows what is expected in each area. And they use a lot, a lot of what's called visual supports, a lot of pictures to help them understand what's going on, because they don't always understand. They're, they're sometimes confused. And they're also, they start what are called schedules, which are still popular today, because they don't know what to expect. You know, they wake up in the morning, if they don't know what to expect, it's confusing. So schedule would say, you know, 8 o'clock you do this, 9 o'clock you do this. Sometimes you show pictures, and they can read, they do words. But we know that schedules really do help them a lot. It just gives them some type of organization. They know what to expect. Okay, next slide. 
Um, the Greenspan method, um, also there's some people, it's, some would call it play therapy, but what's different from the others, they really stress the emotional part, which we feel is a big issue in autism. Emotional development, and they often let the child determine what to work on, because they're interested at the time. And so rather than just at a table one-on-one, -on -one, like ABA, they're on the ground playing, that's why they call it four time. And a lot of communication, a lot of interaction, very intense. And, um, and, it, and there's not much research, but you know I hear very good stories. And basically what I've learned over the years, because there's a lot of different treatments out there that I've seen, and I just mentioned the three big ones, um, and there, again, others too, and they claim success, and, you know, if you assume that's all true, what they all have in common is that they're intense. Int often one-on-one, -on -one, right in the child's face, and kind of forcing yourself, or forcing them to pay attention. And I think that's really the key to a lot of these programs, that you're forcing them to pay attention to what you're, what you're trying to teach them. And there's different ways to get their attention, whether you're playing on the floor, or you're sitting at a table offering them a little candy if they do it right. But the intensity, I think, is the key to uh, a successful treatment. Okay. So, um, yeah, next slide. Just want to mention briefly about communication. Uh, we know communication is extremely important. Um, I used to um, do some consulting at state hospitals, institutions, and um, you know, asked to give advice dealing with those who had severe behavior problems. And almost all of them had no way to communicate. They didn't point. They didn't look at point pictures. Anything. And there's again some good evidence showing the more, the better they could communicate, the fewer behavioral problems. And the happier they are. They could actually express their needs and their wants. And when you can't express it, or other people don't understand, it makes everything very difficult. So one popular one, I you know in Moscow, and they have many seminars, and I encourage you know a lot of training here too, is the picture exchange communication system. Um, it's not too hard to get certified in that, go through training, and it's basically relying on pictures to help communicate uh, for those who have difficulty. Okay. Um, also, communication devices, um, we're finding using tablets, like iPads and so on, are very helpful. There's a lot of communication apps for little or no money. And again, these kids love to do it, sometimes after they communicate, you know, they get some visual reward and so on. So um, that is something else I would consider. And a lost art the sign language. Um, they used to use it a lot in the old days. A lot of parents would argue, I don't want to use sign language because they use sign instead of not talking. But there's actually some research in the 60s and 70s indicating that if you teach speech at the same time as sign language, they're more likely to talk earlier than if you just did speech by itself. And they actually stimulate a, 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 the same area of the brain. And so if the child you know, doesn't, isn't able to speak, um, then at least they'll have some sign language. So um, again, it's not used as much um, as it used to be, but if I had a child who didn't speak, I would do sign language and speech at the same time. Because if they are able to speak, sign language will help them out. And if they won't be able to speak, they will sign language. So communication is really important. Okay, so let's move on to um, older people, adults. <clears throat> so, um, about 20, 30 years ago, maybe longer, people were saying, let's start worrying about adults. You know, we're seeing an increase in autism, we're going to see a lot of adults in the future, but it was mostly talk. It wasn't much done. In fact, um, I helped pull together a book back in the early 2000s where we had parents who were successful with adults uh, adult, um, write about what they did. And, but since then, especially the past 10 years, there's been a lot more attention 
on adults with autism. And there's some big issues that we need to deal with that we're still trying to figure out. One is their living situation. Where do they live when the parents can no longer take care of them? Because today in the United States, there's a lot of adults living with their parents. Parents are aging, and the question is, what do they do? So there's different situations. Some parents make an effort to pay off their home. So they own the home. And then when the parents are gone, they turn the home into a group home, where they bring in two or three other adults to live there. And then the other adults, their parents, wind up paying monthly to help pay for someone to take care of them and the food and so on. And so that actually is happening quite a bit in the United States. Some, um, there's also group homes, um, that they're building more and more of the group homes. And actually, I uh, do some work with the architect. And the architect is um, helping design group homes so it's um, easy for those with autism to live there. Now there's some who live um, semi-independently. I know some parents are purchasing old hotels where someone with autism lives in each room, but then they hire someone to check on them every once in a while. Or there's others who live by themselves in their own apartment, and then someone checks on them. But, the, but you really need to do that because with autism, they sometimes are very, what they call, literal. For example, uh, one case I know of, <clears throat> um, someone came to check on him, and they checked the refrigerator. And they saw they had a lot of this old food, you know, you know, very old food. And they said, why are you saving all this old food? And he goes, you never throw away leftovers. So he knew this old saying, at least in the United States, you don't throw away leftovers, so he just took it to heart, and he saved all his food. And so, um, so there was some that needed someone to check on them. And others, they could live totally independently. And they're doing really well. Autism, but they're able to live on their own. But what happens is you have to teach them everything, so, because they may not realize certain things. As far as employment, um, unemployment is very high in autism. You know, though many of them are great workers, you know, they always take that 15-minute break. They, you know, they don't socialize, so they work with what they're doing, and they are, some are excellent. But the big thing is it's hard to, what we say, pass the interview, because they're different. And I know, like, with Temple Grand, she says, you know, come up with a resume or portfolio, and don't do the interview, but go around, you know, talk to a friend who knows a friend who works somewhere. <clears throat> but there's a lot who do, uh, people, adults who want to work, but they just, um, people don't understand them. But uh, that's changing um, in society and in the workplace, where there is a big effort to accept people on, with autism to work in, the, in um, the businesses. So next slide. So another big issue that's become more and more popular is what do they do when they don't work? And they already have a place to it. And that's recreation. What do they do in their fun time? And so, um, well, one, we are always saying exercise is really important. Because some of them will just sit and watch TV or play video games and may not realize how important exercise is. So we you know, really encourage them to join a gym and there's, or just meet with another group to do more regular exercise. And that's very important. Uh, but they also need to do social things. You know, team sports, soccer um, is very common. Um, going to movies, um, going to plays, shopping, and even dating. There's a dating site for autism on the internet. But what's interesting, <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of accommodations in the U.S. And I've heard other places too. For example, shopping malls, they'll put aside two or three hours a week where they dim the lights and then turn off the sound um, so it's a lot easier for people with autism to shop. Uh, movie theaters, um, um, what they do is actually turn off the lights so it's not too dark, but they'll lower the volume. And it's okay to run around. 
So then, so there's movie theaters that, you know, a couple of nights a month put aside time for autism. And even musicals and plays um, have done that as well. So the adults were starting to, um, they're being more and more accepted in um, society, in the community, and um, by accepting them, there's accommodations. So um, it's much easier um, to go outside their house and to um, shop and enjoy things. Um, other important areas um, that's often ignored, um, adults also have medical issues, and that should be looked at and not ignored. Uh, some of them have behavioral issues, some are very severe, and those who are very severe, it's very hard to find a group home that will accept them. And we get a lot of calls from parents with older ones saying, I need help. My child's 30 years old. And when he was little, he would, you know, hit you, but it wouldn't hurt that much. But now he's 30 years old, big and strong, and when he hits you, it hurts. And, um, and so, and there's not too many professionals who will deal with behavioral problems in adults, and we really need a lot more help in that area. Law enforcement, um, sometimes when they walk down their street, they're acting differently, and the police might stop them. Or they may have um, um, certain behaviors that may cause trouble. For example, one um, sprinklers, you know, that um, while you go on, uh, one I know he collected sprinklers. And so in the middle of the night he'd go out and, you know, take them from neighbors. And he'd go home and clean them up and put a serial number. And then he was once caught and got in trouble with the police. Or someone, well, actually a few I know, <clears throat> they look in homes of people and they are arrested for looking, peeking in the homes when they're only wanting to look at the ceiling fan. So we hear a lot of different stories like this. Um, and so law enforcement, we feel, need to be aware. Um, some people, parents will go to a local police station, fire station, introduce their child, give them um, a notebook with a picture of their child, and describe their child. So if they're stopped in the future, then at least um, the law enforcement and police department will be aware of them and will help them out. And then another issue, which um, I'm just, um, I put together the first think tank in North America, is on aging as they get older. Seniors, <laughs> what do you do? And so next slide. So this came out earlier this year. And it was reported by some of the top researchers and clinicians we met in um, Vancouver, Canada for a few days to discuss what are the issues when you're 50 years and older in autism. And so this is a fairly new area, but based on estimates, if you include those who are diagnosed and those who are not diagnosed, um, I, predict, I based on my numbers um, and the population, it's roughly a half a million in the United States have autism and are over 50 years of old age. So next slide. So some of the issues um, is, um, would be seizures, gastrointestinal problems, immune problems. Uh, oh, but regarding this, it's interesting. These issues you see in the normal population, the neurotypical population, who don't have autism, but who get older. So when you get older, you deal with these issues. But well, with autism, they've dealt with these issues since they were very young. Okay, so it's very interesting. So a lot of the uh, medical problems in autism are common in just neurotypical people as they get older. Just, you know, as we age, we again get seizures, GI problems, immune problems, bone density problems, memory, executive processing, and sensory. So the question. If they have all these problems when they're young, how does it develop? What is, is it worse when they're 50 or 60 years old? Is it the same? Is it different? We don't know. So we've got to start asking these questions now, and we're asking these questions right now. <clears throat> okay, so wrapping up the tip question. So a few things I want to say. <clears throat> so as far as ongoing research, the big question a lot of us are asking, can autism be prevented? We don't want to get rid of these individuals. They're incredible people. 
Well, the preventive as far as autistic behaviors. Um, we want them to um, be able to understand what's going on. We want them to be um, comfortable with their social relationships. Uh, we don't want them to be in pain or discomfort. We want them to be happy campers. We want them to have a quality of life. And so the question is, can autism be prevented? I know there's a couple of major research going on now where during the pregnancy they're having the mother avoid toxins, anything that could cause um, um, you know, um, toxins that have no, like <clears throat> foods without pesticides, um, organic meats, clean air, clean water, um, and vitamins and minerals to supplement to make sure the pregnancy is healthy. And they're, they're, so they're working on these pregnant women now who've already had one child with autism just to see if they'll have a second child. Because if you have one child with autism, the chances of a second one is roughly 20%, 18 to 20%. So there's a lot of research on preventing autism. Um, biomarkers, I mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot of good research right now, it's, you see it in the media, at least I'm seeing it, um, where you could do a blood test, and we hope urine tests, which are easier, to be able to see if um, the child, you may wind up with a, a child with autism or not, both in pregnancy, <clears throat> we're trying to look at pregnancy and also after birth, um, so we'll see. Um, and another question is recovery. There's evidence that roughly 18 to 20 percent recover, and they're not cured, but um, they, people don't realize that this individual has autism or once had autism. Uh, they get married, hold a job, um, do you know? But often they're you know a little different, eccentric, quirky, but you know, society likes those types of individuals. So. Um, but you know, as far as we, and, but we cannot predict right now. If we could subtype autism, <clears throat> I hope we'll be able to determine what subtypes have the, the best prognosis. Um, other exciting research: stem cell research. Um, um, I know parents are very excited about stem cells. Researchers, not as much. They're more into the genes. <clears throat> but there's some uh, one of the top researchers um, in the United States is looking at stem cells. She, published a study the last year, the year before. And um, the first study, you find out if there's any negative effects. And she found no negative effects. Um, and um, some just general reports of positive, but we need to learn a lot more. And there's different forms of stem cell, and um, I'd be very cautious, because I know you could go to certain countries to get stem cell therapy, but I don't know, I'd rather be safe than sorry. I, Suggest if you're very interested in stem cells, waiting a couple more years until there's real evidence to show that it works, or what way, what type of stem cell therapy works, because you don't want to take a chance with a child. So, um, and again, a lot of people are interested, and we hope to have answers fairly soon. Um, and gene therapy, they're looking at certain genes, you know, sequences, see which ones are associated with autism. And <clears throat> given that, can you alter it, modify it, to take those behaviors away? There's a, a mouse study, um, and it's only a mouse, <clears throat> but that they were able to breed repetitive behaviors, same behavior over and over again, and they modified a gene sequence and it stopped the repetitive behaviors. So there's a lot of excitement in this area, where you find the sequences in the genes related to autistic behaviors, and then you modify that sequence to see if those autistic behaviors um, become better, are improved. And that, I think, is where the future of autism research is. And I know there's a lot of people interested and excited about that. And the last one, which I've mentioned, is subtyping autism, because I, I truly feel that if we could figure out different types of autism, we could better able to figure out the genes and therapies and other causes associated with each type. There might be a type that's associated with pesticide exposure, another type ex exposed to heavy metal exposure. We don't know. But um, first, we need to subtype them. You can subtype them physiologically or behaviorally, 
It's a lot of work and it's very expensive. So I'm going to finish off giving some advice. So first, advice to professionals. Um, I stress it's best to keep up to date with the research. Um, I know with my organization, we spend most of our time summarizing research that we feel is important and getting it out there. We have several e-newsletters. We have a science hard copy newsletter. It'd be great if people in Ukraine could translate some of our work, and we're more than happy to show which ones we feel are the most important. And so we could work together on that, and that'd be great. So really keep up with the research. You don't want to rely on research from 10 or 20 years ago. So a lot is going on more than ever before. And I actually have an e-newsletter called Clinical Research in Autism. <coughs> and that's for obstetricians and pediatrician nurses to talk about diagnosis and risks and early medical treatment. This is all peer-reviewed studies. Um, it's free. You can find it on the website, autism.com. And you know, we also have webcasts, where it's almost weekly. We have experts talk about many different issues. And soon after, we put it up on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. We have experts. The good thing is if you watch these live, you can type in the questions, and the expert will answer your question. Uh, but we've had over 300,000 views over the past just two or three years. So it's a very popular in the field. I also encourage um, professionals uh, to be aware of other areas of, of uh, research and treatment. So if you're a medical doctor, be aware of sensory interventions and behavioral therapies and so on, not just the medical. And for behaviorists, I know there's quite a few, be aware of some of the medical issues, and be aware of the sensory issues and so on. So, um, and I'm working on some wonderful white pages where it's kind of a, the current research in all these different areas where it's easy to read and it's only a few pages each. But I, you know, you don't have to know the literature in great detail, but enough to keep track of what's going on, especially if you want to specialize in autism. And also, um, for professionals, listen to parents. Parents are with their kids 24 hours a day, with medical doctors and others. You may only see the child for 15 minutes or 30 minutes. And <clears throat> they, the parents really know what's going on. Obviously, they want the best for their children. So advice for parents, um, again, be knowledgeable about many different areas. And again, my uh, organization is one source. Um, if someone says, I have a cure for autism, and I hear that all the time, we get letters all the time, and emails saying, I figured out the cause and the cure, and they want us to drop everything we're doing <laughs> and just focus on their, their idea. But if anyone says, I could cure your child, or this could be the cure, um, I hear that all the time, and you know, we've known about autism for 75 years, and no cure. And if there really is a cure, you know, you want some evidence to show that that's really true. So be really careful, because it, it, it's out there a lot. This, you know, so that's a, a big warning. You know, ask them what the evidence is. And if they say, well, it's my idea, I'm pretty sure it will work well. Or if they say there is research, ask to see the research. Because sometimes they say there is, but there really isn't. So, and, and if it is published, make sure it's in a good journal, not some little tiny newsletter that you know, very few people subscribe. So, you know, because if you want to help your child, you want to use things that have been shown to really help and not waste your time and money on treatments that could just waste your time and money. <clears throat> and also, what I tell parents, in some ways, it, it's partly your responsibility to let the doctors know and the therapists, because they may not be looking at the literature. If you come across a great article, um, give them a copy. You know, help them learn about autism. Not all, but many are very much interested in learning, because they often just don't have time. Or autism is a small part of their practice. So the more you can help them, um, the better. And um, I think that's extremely important. OK, so there's a couple more slides. It's been a long day already. <clears throat> so for parents, um, 
you have to realize that if a treatment helps one child that you know, you know, that may not help your child. I had someone who used to work for me, and um, people would call about a vitamin, vitamin B6, which actually had a lot of research, um, helps almost half. And they, whenever she would answer the phone, <clears throat> she would say, don't try it because I tried it on my child for two days and he still has autism. <laughs> and uh, when I overheard her once, I said, why are you telling them that? She said, well, that's what happened. I gave G6 two days and my child still autism. I said, well, one, it doesn't cure autism. Second, only helps about half. And um, third, you give for more than two days. You give for a few months. And so if you have a friend who has a child with autism, something worked, don't assume it's going to help your child. You might want to try it, but one, a, a treatment helps one child doesn't mean it's going to help everyone. And that's almost for any treatment out there. Um, you to, so just because it helps some, it doesn't uh, help all. And also, you know, and this is mostly based on my experience, and I assume there's some research, now with autism, they tend to get better with age. <clears throat> when they're young, they're active and all over the place, but they do tend to get better with age. And what we feel is that parts of the brain are just underdeveloped, not necessarily damaged, but underdeveloped. And over time, it just grows, but more slowly than the same age peers. So in general, they do get better with age. Not always, but many of them do. And also, be careful about puberty because um, um, sometimes because of the hormonal changes, they may have, start to have seizures. And um, so if your child is slowly getting better, and all of a sudden around puberty um, levels off or tends to get worse, then you might want to check to see if they may be dealing with some seizures, because we do see that in quite a few individuals. Okay, so they're slowly getting better and better, and then puberty, they level off, no more improvement, or get worse, again, I would really look into the possibility of seizures. Doesn't mean they have seizures, but that is one sign that they might. And um, it's also important to realize that autism is treatable. They do, there's a lot of treatments that will help them. Um, just because it might be genetic doesn't mean it, can't, it cannot be helped. I remember when Dr. Redlin, who founded my organization, when he would give a talk, he would say, I have a genetic disorder. Um, if it wasn't corrected, I couldn't drive. I couldn't work. I couldn't read. And then he wiggles glasses and he would say, I have poor eye vision. So just because there's a genetic component to autism, it, it, they still can be helped. And for many years, a lot of people didn't think they could be helped. And for a campaign that we actually started, um, basically the, the, the term autism is treatable. And unfortunately, not everyone, but the majority can be helped in one way or another. So conclusion. And so autism is known for 75 years. 1943 was the first paper. And we're still trying to figure out what causes and best treatments. And we can see we know a lot more now than before, but our understanding with the new technology, some brilliant people jumping on board these days, um, we're getting answers pretty darn fast. And um, it's just an exciting time to follow what's going on because what was fairly new 10 years ago were um, really understanding quite a bit, and the goal is to understand everything about autism. And that's why you do research, to get answers to help these individuals. And then, um, then as I mentioned before, uh, when you, I know a lot of the autism organizations, but just in general, it's really important to share the information. Because there's a lot of parents who are not part of networks, who are not on the internet a lot, don't have time, a lot of physicians don't have time to look at the literature, but when you come across something really that you think is really important, share it with others. Because that's, I think, the best way uh, we could really um, move this field forward and find solutions to all the, the big questions out there. So, uh, thank you for your time, and um, I, I enjoy Kia. Thank you.
so um, <clears throat> we could ask some questions, and I'll do my best. So I'm not sure. So maybe someone could help me with the. Okay. No, I don't need this. Здравствуйте, спасибо за прекрасную лекцию. Я не профессионал, поэтому, наверное, заранее стоило бы извиниться, возможно, за неуместный вопрос. Тем не менее, я хотел бы поинтересоваться о том, что вот мы знаем, аутизм в основном, как я понимаю, обусловлен физиологически, какими-то физиологическими патологиями. Можем ли мы на сегодняшний момент говорить о существовании такого вида аутизма, ну, скажем так, как культурный аутизм, обусловленный отказом от социальных каких-то норм, от языка, от социальных ценностей, и таким образом человек как бы ведет себя ну, подобным образом, как вот. В этом вопросе есть смысл вообще. Спасибо. Autism is biological. <clears throat> it involves genetics, environment, neurology, but um, um, I, um, I'm not aware of, <clears throat> you might say, where someone is, is neurotypical and their autism is because of <clears throat> they don't want to accept the culture. You know, there's, other, there's probably that issue out there, but it would not be autism. So yeah, that, the, the issue is out there, I'm sure, but I would not put it with autism. Yeah. But it's a good question, an interesting question. Like that, and then you 
I mean, not you, but your organization has thought to publish such books. Why and uh, why not to? <laughs> So, yeah, so why yeah. not do? Uh, why your organization does not continue to publish uh, such books uh, now? Well, uh, basically, um, that protocol um, only dealt with biomedical uh, nutri nutrients, gastrointestinal, and that's it. And it didn't look at the whole person. It didn't acknowledge ABA. It didn't acknowledge sensory. <clears throat> so it only dealt with biomedical. And in those days, um, we were the only ones looking at gastrointestinal. We were the only ones looking at the immune system. <clears throat> we were the only ones looking at metabolism. <clears throat> and we were the only ones um, teaching doctors. But what happened it became so popular that other organizations started to do the same thing. And we were also able to recruit many top um, medical doctors <clears throat> to work on those issues that we started. And so we helped pioneer and get those off the ground. But we, our organization, we consider ourselves always looking for new ways. So we felt that that was somewhat established. People now are treating and understanding GI and these other medical issues. So, so we have expanded into looking at other things to also consider behavioral, to also include sensory to also start worrying about adults on the spectrum, to start worrying about seniors. So it's just a growth of the organization over time, rather than doing the same thing over and over again. And again, um, a lot of other people in the field have started um, following what we began. So that's, that's the main reason. I would like to thank you for your question and ask you more about the research. Question about the research. Tell me, please, какое-то явление приобретает массовость, да? Почему вот такую массовость не говорить, это о какой-то эволюционном процессе, да? Природа редко ошибается, и действительно вот тех вот крайних случаев утиста, то, что ниже водолений, их все меньше и меньше, а все больше эти адап это адаптированные да, варианты какого-то аутического спектра, и эм, оно это даже похоже на какое-то дозревание нервной системы. Эволюция не закончилась, вот прямо сейчас, да? И нервная система постоянно продолжает дозревать, и это зависит, конечно, от входящих раздражителей огромного количества. Мне просто интересно ваше мнение по этому поводу. Благодарю. Um, there's actually a lot of people have talked about the evolution that um, our society is evolving and maybe the future is autism. But there has been a lot of talk for 20 years about that idea. As far as actually proving that true, I think it would be very difficult. Um, uh, but along those lines, some people have argued that autism is our way to adapt to change due to the pollution in the air and all the toxins, because that's the best way to survive. <clears throat> but as far as actual evidence, I'm not aware of it, but it has been well discussed among quite a few people throughout the autism community. And it might be true. I just don't know. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I have a question about the subtyping that you were talking about. So um, with regards to that, it seems like there's a whole, um, like an enormous amount of things to look at when it comes to what could cause the different subtypes of autism. Um, so um, I wanted to know, in your experience, what would be like the um, best way to do initial studies on the different subtypes of autism? Right. Um, there's a lot of different ways. Um, I know there's um, someone at Stanford who's doing <clears throat> a lot of um, biological tests in many different ways and seeing how they might cluster. Um, the approach we're taking <clears throat> is that um, we want to first look at clusters of behaviors where a group, everyone in that group is very similar. They won't be identical to normal distribution, but very similar. And then you take the most prototype of each cluster and then do all the biological testing. And with, with one of our databases, we have um, over 40,000 cases. 
And then with other organizations, they have also um, offered to let us analyze their database. So just looking for funds <coughs> to be able to analyze it. But, so you could either go with the physiological route and see what clusters physiologically, or go the opposite behavioral age for clusters, and then look at what the physiology. Well, what's interesting, the GI talks to the brain, so there's actually communication. Um, <clears throat> but um, um, I, they're two different systems. Um, honestly, if someone has GI problems, no matter if they have autism or not, I think they should be treated. They shouldn't have GI problems. <clears throat> and as far as treating the brain, you know, there's only a, a few ways in autism to treat the brain. So. Um, you know, once we can subtype, it's going to be a lot easier to figure out which treatments for each type. But right now, it's unfortunately guesswork, and that's why some treatments help some, and other treatments help others. So, you know, um, I wish I had some answers, but, you know, uh, I wish we were five years ahead of, or three years later. Well, invite me in three years. Uh, thank you again for coming today. Um, I'm an expressive arts therapist and mental health counselor, and um, I know that there's been a lot of research about uh, music therapy helping um, children, at least uh, on the autism spectrum. So I was just curious if your organization has partnered with any uh, with the music therapy um, association in the states and the right. research on that. Well, as far as music therapy, there hasn't been a lot of research, there's some research. <clears throat> and um, it is promising. I know a lot of people who've gone through it, who've done well. 
Um, but with my organization, um, most of our focus is on the medical, um, but we just try to keep track of the others. So um, all of our research funding is on medical. Um, we do have a, a, a science newsletter we publish quarterly. It's still hard to copy. <clears throat> and then occasionally we will have something on music therapy. Um, but someday the goal is to have um, all researchers and organizations talk to each other and communicate because we really have to take the approach that we're all in it together. <clears throat> and when I look at the field, I see it as very scattered. I see here's one study looking at GI, one aspect of GI, another study here on GI, another aspect. They don't talk to each other. There's a mean study here. And one type of study that I keep you know, stressing that we're not seeing much is where you take the same individuals and do all the testing. You take the same 30 kids and look at their immune system, their metabolism, their GI, uh, their genetics. And then, um, then you could come up with a profile of individuals. But right now, they're all independent samples. There are all different types of autism. And but for you know what we're all striving for is that we're all working together. It's not a horse race, and um, we are all in harmony throughout the world, trying to figure out the answers. Because we realize after 75 years, one person is not going to figure out all the answers. So we really have to do teamwork, and um, you know we, that's uh, one of the reasons I'm here in Kiev to start getting some other countries involved in one way or another, whether it's through my organization or others, but we really have to improve the networking and communication and really cheer each other on rather than say, I have the answer or my area has the answer. And this is taking some time, but we've got to get the momentum, we've got to work together, and this is taking a long time, but we, we can do it. Добрый день. Спасибо, было очень интересно. У меня больше практический вопрос, ориентированный на педагогов и психологов, которые работают в детских центрах. Можете ли дать какой-то совет или советы, как организовать учебный процесс, когда в общем коллективе появляются дети-аутисты? Спасибо. Well, um, unfortunately, I'm not an expert in education, uh, but in the classroom, um, I would um, consider different aspects. I think an important part is a sensory. Um, I know when you talk to adults, they tell them, say that their school days were horrible, um, the lights were too bright, there was the alarm bell would go off, they never knew when there would be an unexpected sound. Um, a lot of children would hurt them and bully them. Uh, the teachers didn't understand why they did things. Um, so I think um, with educators, it would be important to um, be aware of some of the, you might say, complaints that adults who lived it could share because they have a lot to say. And, um, and then also just be well aware of what's going on in the field. But um, um, and it would be nice someday to have a, a, well, I'm sure there's conferences for educators on autism. But, um, but as far as practical, there may be some books I'm not aware of. But, uh, yeah, sure. Я немножко добавлю, поскольку я занималась вопросом аутиста в школе. Значит, нужно смотреть на три составляющие. Составляющая первая – сами дети. Ребенок, когда попадает в школу, очень много для него меняется. Это нормально для всех детей, поэтому первая неделя в школе – это полный хаос. Аутисту хаос тяжело, поэтому, чтобы ребенку было проще привыкнуть в школе и в ней существовать, первое, что нужно делать – подготовить самого ребенка. Нужно убедиться, что он может высидеть уроки, нужно убедиться, что он может выдержать сенсорную нагрузку. Желательно познакомить ребенка со школой в принципе еще до того, как начнутся занятия. Если он может прийти на несколько пробных занятий, прекрасно. Иногда ребенок может приходить на полдня, пока он привыкнет и сможет выдерживать целый день. 
Часть следующая. Учителя. Учителя должны знать, что такое аутизм и как с этим работать. Я делаю лекции специально для школ, где я подробно все это расписываю. Сейчас это очень общие мозги. У учителя должна быть поддержка. Литература уже есть. Фонд этого новогоднем издал книгу, которая помогает провести учителя по аутисту в классе. Также должно быть очень хорошее сообщение между родителями, учителями и специалистами, поскольку если у ребенка есть какие-то особенности, например, он не выдерживает, когда доску царапают звук, вот просто его выносит, об этом нужно знать. То есть индивидуальные моменты опасности, вот на что нужно смотреть, где нужно ребенка поддержать, те, кто с этим ребенком работает, должны об этом знать, чтобы не доводить ребенка до крайней степени. Также школа должна быть готова к самому аутисту. Например, обязательно должна быть тихая комната, где перегруженный ребенок может зайти и успокоиться, провести себя в ногу. Последняя часть – это родители других детей. Сами дети не знают, что такое аутизм, но они видят, что ребенок ведет себя как-то иначе. Они приходят домой с наших родителей. Папа, мама, а вот он делает вот так, вот, что это такое? Что отвечают родители? Родители отвечают по-разному. Если ответ негативный, то отсюда и, собственно, вырастает и буллинг, и плохое отношение к ребенку. То есть работа с классом, работа с родителями класса подготовительная тоже должна быть. Если совсем коротко, то, пожалуй, все. А, тьютер. Некоторым детям с аутизмом нужен тьютер. Некоторые могут без тьютера, но тем, кому он нужен, должны его иметь. То есть каждому ребенку должна быть поддержка, соответственно, его уровня. Вот, если очень коротко. А, еще вопросы? Да. Safest way, but 
as far as the vaccine issue, I know there's a lot of attention, and um, 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 the evidence, again, right now shows no connection, but again, there's a lot of parents who will say their child changed soon after, so, um, and um, I, I tend to follow what the data says, so I, I still think, you know, there's some things that need to be known, um, just in general, but um, um, I just go with the safest route. Здравствуйте. У меня есть вопрос такой более как бы и теоретический, и практический. Я занимаюсь нейрореабилитацией, нейропедагогикой, и в то же время пишу диссертацию по нейронарушениям. Ну, в связи с этим, как бы, то, что вы говорите, и то, что мы понимаем, что все-таки э, аутическая проблема, она связана с тем, что либо мозг реагирует на какую-то психосоматическую патологию, либо есть какая-то нейрогенная почва для этой патологии. То есть это взаимосвязь такая. Э, и э, на сегодняшний день как бы, мы в аспекте именно развития нервных э, волокон через двигательную активность. И также формирование поведения, начиная от правильных движений, осознанных движений, осознанного поведения и заканчивая когнитивным поведением и когнитивной и социальной расширением, социальной э, коммуникацией и так далее. То есть, есть ли у вас такие исследования, проводите ли такие комплексные исследования и были ли у вас результаты именно э, в сфере того, насколько развиваются нервные связи новые, через двигательную активность и через расширение социальных связей. Спасибо. Добрый день, я хочу задать три 
Ви розповідали про порівняння аутизму між братами і сестрами. Чи існує дослідження в порівнянні аутизму в різних поколіннях усієї справдині? Дякую. Чи існує дослідження в порівнянні аутизму між поколінням в одній родині? Quite a few genetic studies that do look at grandparents, parents, and children. And um, actually, you, you see um, quite a few relatives have autism or autistic behaviors. Um, and so uh, there is genetic work on that, but they really haven't come across anything uh, major. In fact, if anything, they do not see as much overlap as they expect. Um, they, they see it through generations, but they don't see the same genes. And so, um, yeah, and so that's a hard question. It's a good question to ask, but it's a hard question to answer right now. Yeah, sorry, Прививки приводят к аутизму. Есть ли какие-то исследования, которые это подтверждают, либо опровергают, и на чем основаны в основном такие мифы? Спасибо. The vaccine issue um, you know, has been very controversial, and um, as I mentioned, if you look at the actual research, <clears throat> even though it's all most of all correlational, uh, they're not seeing the relationship. Um, it's quite possible if you break it, autism down into subgroups, there might be something there uh, because they look at autism as a whole. <clears throat> but again, you know, as a researcher, we have to follow the data rather than just our opinion. And again, there have been quite a few studies looking at it, but right now, uh, there's really no solid evidence that vaccines cause autism. <clears throat> I think um, one thing we do have to start getting a better handle is about the immune system. <clears throat> and I think once we um, could understand what's really going on um, regarding the immune system, it, it's going to shed a lot of light in terms of that issue as well as many other Issues. So, but again, as a researcher, I, I, I'm, I try not to rely on opinion, but rely on the data. Ну, тоді я думаю, що ми можемо подякувати Стівену за таку активну участь в розбудові проти нашої країни. Я сподіваюся на те, що ті, хто був сьогодні присутній, або ваші знайомі, долучаться до того, що ми можемо взяти участь в тому, щоб була переведена старі, щоб були переведені або окремі дослідження, або всі сторінки сайту і були доступні для наших громадян. Дякую.